Hello, everybody. It's really my pleasure to be here with all of you. I want to thank Drager to make this possible, to talk about uh, one of my passion, that is uh, the, the concept of value-based healthcare. So we are going to apply this new concept in medicine uh, in the world of anesthesia. So here you have my conflict of interest. Uh, I've been dedicated all my life to mechanical ventilation. I start in the world of pediatric and anesthesia and intensive care. And now since 12, last 12 years, I'm dedicated in the world of adults. So I've always working in the lab and in clinical side uh, about mechanical ventilation. I receive uh, grants for my research and speaker fees, but I, I always keep myself uh, in the side that to help everybody, uh, the technology to improve and, and to always collaborate to, with, with my, my, my studies. So for this uh, lecture, I really consider that I'm totally open with a new window that I think all clinicians and all anesthesiologists must go through. Well, uh, the agenda for today, we are going to talk about evidence-based medicine. We all know uh, about uh, this concept that is uh, in our practice, but I, I want to be a little, um, let's say, uh, have a different point of view. Um, a, clinician, a clinical point of view. And on the other side, let's go for some weak points that uh, whenever people talk about evidence-based medicine, it seems like uh, it's, it's, nobody can say anything against it, it's, the, it's, it's God, nobody can say a single word about this. And I want you to, to mention quite a few uh, things that still is not covered by evidence-based medicine, and you will see how uh, this new concept of value-based medicine is really uh, helping us in these areas. And basically, we are going to apply all these new concepts in the world of anesthesia. So I highly recommend to all of you to read this paper. I think this is wonderful. They are a very well-known fathers of obedience-based medicine, but you are going to see the real, the real obedience-based medicine not the ones that many speakers talk about it, like if you don't perform a clinical randomized trial, you must be shut up and you cannot say a single word. And this is not what really evidence-based medicine is saying. Uh, the best concept that we have to have in clear is like evidence-based medicine really calls to use current best evidence to make decision about the care of patient. Patient must be in the center of our decision, not the study itself, not the clinical randomized trial. Patients, everything that what we do must be centered on patients. Second, good doctors is not only the ones who perform clinical randomized trials, is the one who really extract the individual clinical expertise, clinical expertise of a good clinical uh, common sense doctor is a valuable thing that we all have to take into account, obviously uh, according and to what the best available external evidence. This is a totally different approach that I've been heard for many uh, speakers. Without clinical expertise, practice risks become tyrannized by evidence. And I'm going to show, uh, and this is what saying that the very important fathers of the obedience-based medicine. So from the very beginning, uh, clinical expertise is something valuable, and we all know that. Obedience-based medicine is not restricted or randomized trials and meta-analysis, and this is all. I'm very sorry, there are more things as we are going to see uh, now. What are the limitations of obedience-based medicine? Well, the first thing, when you want to find out the accuracy of something, diagnostics, tech, or whatever, but you want to know the accuracy, really, uh, randomized clinical trial is not going to help you at all. So we have to, to do another type of studies that traditionally is saying that is nothing, I mean, is, that don't have any value for the some kind of a strange radical approach in evidence-based medicine. Uh, what's happened with rare or orphan disease? There are thousands thousands of orphan disease with thousands and thousands of patients. And it's impossible by definition 
to perform a single cl uh, clinical randomized trial or to create a meta-analysis. This meant that we have to uh, orphan and abandon all these patients. For a question about prognosis, very important. What really cares about a patient? A patient, if you are centered in the patient, what they really are care about is prognosis. And prognosis cannot be find out through clinical randomized trials. You need pure uh, follow-up studies uh, that traditionally, if you go for this radical approach of evidence, is nothing. No, no, don't do any uh, prospective uh, epidemiological study that really is going to tell you your results in your hospital. The question is, if a patient come to your office and want to be operated about, about what any kind of procedure, what are the results that really cares this patient? Your results in your hospital with your surgeons or the results in the, the last meta-analysis done in the Mayo Clinic? So if you think and change the mentality and you put the patient in the center, then uh, you will see that this kind of things uh, change the approach. And, and, and another one is uh, uh, someone uh, think like, for example, animal lab studies. Oh no, whenever they say, this, is, this study is done in rats. So everybody uh, don't, don't even read it and throw it away. I'll give you a very clinical, clinical uh, clinically important example. I've been dedicated all my life to study the safety range of pressure between uh, pneumothorax and recruit maneuvers. I have more than seven papers saying what is the safety range. If someone from the study of our trial have read it or papers have shown, we, sh we, we present more than 80 years ago that if you go farther than 50 centimeters of water, you are in risk to create pneumothorax. So if the, the, the clinician who do this clinical randomized trial in our trial have a study, the animal lab study, because obviously if you want to, to create pneumothorax by definition, it's impossible as far as I know uh, to do it in human beings. Uh, if this clinician don't say, no, this is not evidence, I'm not going to, to, to read a single paper of animals. Probably we have avoided a lot of issues, let's say death in this study. So please uh, have an open mind about what is really important in, in medicine. So just, uh, I really recommend to read this paper from British Medical Journal. I think one of the most clever, nice, and even you can, uh, uh, you can say funny papers I've ever read in my life. Uh, this is a very well-known doctors that they present to us uh, how evidence-based medicine have his limitation with any kind of problem. And they say, if parachute used to prevent death, you know, minor trauma related to gravitational challenge. And they did by pure, in a perfect, perfect, extremely way, perfectly way in base medicine, systematic review and randomized clinical trials. And what they say, say, I'm very sorry, there are not single randomized con uh, control trials uh, if the parachute used to prevent death or not. There are only uh, cases. So why do you have to use parachute whenever you have to throw out from a plane? And uh, if you follow the paper, the consequences and the, the is, is clear, please, you don't have to, according with base medicine, you don't have to use parachute. So please, um, uh, every time you hear something that uh, uh, clinical randomized trials is everything in medicine, it's clear that it's not like this. So uh, when I discover I've been involved in, va in value-based uh, medicine, this is a new totally approach that obviously, obviously, get the good part of uh, base me evidence based medicine. But this is another approach that really put the patient in the center. So the first thing they say, the only thing that really cares doctors or should care doctors is outcomes. Why? Because the patient really what they want is the results that matter most to the patient and obviously divided by cost. 
This is the one of the father, Michael Porter. I highly recommend for the ones who still are not really mastered in this new approach that really get into it, to, it, to this as soon as possible. Um, I want to share with you this data, uh, especially because uh, I was really what, I mean, it was, uh, I was happy when I, I saw this data. Uh, in this data, in the, the red part, you have the life expectancy of, a, of a different countries. And in the green line, you have the GDP spend. So, so what the, the, the country spend in healthcare. So here you can see perfectly uh, things that we theoretically know, but in this graph it is extremely uh, clear. For example, in the, I'm very sorry, uh, and I want to be polite to everybody, this is only data, but we all know, for example, the United States is by far the country who spend more money in healthcare by far, um, almost double than the rest of the, of the countries. And on the contrary, if you see the life expectancy, it's one of the lowest, only 81 years old. On the other hand, you have some kind of, of, of very efficient uh, countries, like for example, Korea, that they spend very low amount of uh, money in healthcare, but on the contrary, they have a very high uh, life expectancy. And we are very proud to be here Spain, uh, we are just in the middle of Spain in, in healthcare, but on the contrary, we are of one of the countries who have higher life expectancy with Japan. So uh, what does I want to transmit here? That what you spend, spend in money in healthcare is not always perfectly correlated with the outcomes. This is the new concept that we have to focus from now on. So outcomes are the result people care about, know what the doctor care about, and including obviously functional improvement and what they can do and recovery statement. So uh, how does it start? Ichon. Ichon is a really very nice. I, I highly recommend to go for the website. They have a lot of uh, content here. They have a lot of, 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 of um, uh, test uh, research that you can get familiarized to this new concept. ICHON is an, uh, founded in two, 2012, so really we must say that this is a concept that is quite new. And the story is, uh, is what we say, what is value? What is value for, for the patient? Value is what patient really wants, the outcomes they want divided by cost. So um, the story about how can we measure is if you, obviously there are hospitals that really have transformed this concept and they already are working on this, but traditionally approach, let's say, we are really not don't care that much about outcomes. How many uh, um, hospitals really measure the outcomes of every single process? And especially the ones who do it only goes for mortality and safety issue and no more than that. And value for a patient is much more than that. Just to say and to focus what really matters to patient is uh, the health status that they achieve. Uh, they want to have more health. I always put one example. Now in this pandemic situation, we are seeing now how many patients go inside of intensive care units for four months, five months, even six months. And the story is after the staying there, probably they go to, 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 the, to the floor, to the ward, for 10 days and then die. So they don't even go outside of the hospital. Do you think this is value to stay six months in an intensive care unit, spending probably 200, 300,000 euros and just not to even have one day free out of the hospital? This is the concept that we we'll have to work in the future. So this is the, the story. Now we have to change totally our approach. We have to measure the, the outcomes. We have to know what are the outcomes that the patient are care about. So um, this is, uh, seems something new and in some part it can be, but it's something that is spread very fast. Here you now, these new concepts are spread in more than 32 countries. There are already more than 600 uh, organization that they are working with it all needs the UNIS concept. And as you can see here, very important representative hospital in the world and going in this direction. 
So I highly recommend to read and to study this uh, handbook because this really is start from scratch in this new concept and really is very simple for any clinician to be involved in this new approach. The story is like, first of, of all, you have to identify the process, let's say prostatectomy resection. Then you have to analyze the internal forces you have in your hospital. You have to start to define the process and the outcomes from two sides, not only from the patients, the outcomes from the uh, clinicians based on evidence-based medicine, from the patient, anesthesiologists, please, we have to be involved in this process from the very beginning, because other ones, the only outcomes it will take into account will be the surgical uh, from the surgeon. So we have to be there. One important thing, if you read the ITON uh, process and the, the, the definition they have, this is wonderful how the patient put in value what anesthesiologists do, because in all surgical process, they always don't want to have pain. Anesthesiologists are the protagonists to avoid pain. They don't want to die, so safety is crucial, and, and don't have any side or second or bad bad side effects. So the the, the responsible for, for the safety environment of the patient definitely is anesthesiologist, and uh, all patients from the very beginning put into a, a, a score that is a very important thing. Then you have to measure, measure data, 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 and measure benchmarking. We have to start with any kind of problem to compare data with the best in class or with other hospitals. Investment to really keep this working all the time. And then incentives to the, to the doctors, learning community, and then this will start to work. So uh, just to put into environment, see for example, this approach, uh, Leeford Hospital Safety Grade. They are uh, platforms who grade the, the hospital in, in according how safety is this hospital, for example, and now is something that we all the hospitals should go in this direction. Uh, this is a very nice new approach, Lone Institute Hospital Index, that they go directly for value-based healthcare. So they um, grade and they told you uh, your hospital in what uh, situation is, is right now uh, according with value-based healthcare. So even now, NHS is trying to do a new approach even in the selling process, in the tenders. They are going to say now, okay, we are going to buy this new technology, but now this technology deserve to obtain better outcomes on the patient. So this is something that is changing everything or practice as a clinician, uh, the, the gestion in the hospital, the process of, of tenders, everything is, is changing around this new concept. Even the way to pay professional, this is personal head budget, even they are saying, okay, if you obtain better outcomes in the patient, then probably part of your uh, incomes should be paid according to our results. So uh, the story, let's go to the final part of the, the lecture that uh, value-based healthcare, how can we assist or how can we get assistance system to do the patient in the OR uh, easier for us and safer for the patient. So the first concept, uh, anesthesiologists, we are very used to stay in the host, in the OR with a lot of monitors run out with a lot of things. In my opinion, if you put other doctors, like any kind of clinician inside of the OR, they will have the same, um, I mean, a strange uh, uh, situation that if you or me put inside of a cabin of a pilot, they say, where, where, I mean, how can I manage this? But in, in a hospital, in an OR, it's exactly the same. You have an, an anesthesia machine with a lot of a screen, a lot of data, monitors, pump, um, more monitors, pain monitors, um, neuro, neurocritical monitors, now even echo. So uh, we are getting used to manage 100,000 of data around us that we have to control. And it seems to, we are used to it, but really this is not normal. I mean, this must be uh, um, operated in the same way that a pilot in, in a plane. So this is the way that is coming now and is by far one of the most important uh, uh, subject in, in medicine healthcare right now is data analytics. 
uh, we are going to go, yes, to pass through that. We all know that this now data analytics is crucial. Uh, why? Because we have a lot of data around us. We, have, we cannot process as human beings all this data and we need help on this. And the help comes from the first state. We have to get data. Then we have to know how to filter, how to report. Mining data, data mining is crucial, is when you start to manage this data, to work with this data, to extract good consequences to help us to do our daily practice. And by, by, and by far, they will come in a big data analytics that final, the endpoint will be clinical tools for clinical decision-making process. So let's see some few examples. For example, I dedicate to mechanical ventilation. I'm sure that all of you know the classic book of Professor Baum for low flow anesthesia. You know how many pages have this. I study many, many times. It's 150 pages. Just to start to get used how to do low flow anesthesia. And 25 years ago, this was more an art than pure science. Uh, we go, can go through hypoxic measure, many side effects. What is low flow anesthesia under the area of big data and new technology? Is please push the button. Now you have software 100% safety with impossible to create any damage to the patient that you only have to push the button and you have the best low flow anesthesia possible. And you have here other, other simple, a smart pilot view is getting information, data, 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 and even can tell you in five minutes, in 10 minutes time, what is going to happen with everything, with pumps, with anesthetics, whatever. So another example, recruit maneuvers. I'm not going to get into this. This is my passion. But really, if you want to do this manually, you have a lot of possibilities to create some mistakes and then some kind of damage on the patient. Now, what is recruit maneuvers and the big data analytics area? Push the button. You can select everything. And this is still is not a closed loop. In the near future, this is not only push the button, it's going to tell you what is the PIP, it's going to set the, tip, the PIP for you. So they only have to say, I want this patient in an open approach. Push the button and the software in a safety way will do the rest. So just to finish, uh, my take home message is like value-based healthcare is necessary, the next step. All clinicians must be there and a sociologist must, must, must be there because otherwise it's not going to be our approach in these outcomes. A standardized outcomes is essential to move for this. And really I recommend everybody to go for iTunes. Taichun is, is, a, is an initiative that can help you in this process. And finally, data analytics, reporting, mining, and big data is the future, and we need that. And we will see more and more assistance systems for clinical decision-making process to improve patient safety in the OR. Thank you so much.